the funnel of misbelief, these four elements, are taking advantage of a lot of our human weaknesses and basically getting normal people to believe very strange things. And eventually what I ended up describing in the book, it's called misbelief, is this mechanism that we as a society created, you know, with lots of different pieces that attack almost all of our psychology. It attacks our emotional system, it attacks our cognitive system, it attacks our personality system, it attacks our social system. You know, if you think about the cookie as a weaponized food that is attacking our smell and taste with sugar, fat and salt, with an ideal combination to want you to get one and then another one, another one, Another one, the funnel of misbelief, these four elements are taking advantage of a lot of our human weaknesses and basically getting normal people to believe very strange things. But the big envelope for all of this is the question of It's still his. I don't miss. I just go, go, go. Like a go, go flow. And I'm almost done. And I told you so. When I throw these flows, like it's Rochambeau. And I ain't too close. It's Joe Smoke goes. And I'm on my grind. That is all the time. I do not do breaks. That's right. I stay in dry. And look, I'm back with a little bit of that. A little more cash than it came with. Ready that cat is out that bag. But I still ask the boy got skills. I don't need her. I don't need him. I don't need help with me. I got this. I can sing songs. I can spit raps. And I can do both. Even do this. Word. Support for the On The Stacks podcast comes from Montage Planning Partners. Partnerships like this make our community a better place to live and work. That's why Montage Planning Partners is proud to support the important work of On The Stacks. When it comes to financial planning, most financial companies ask, what's your salary? At Montage Planning Partners, we ask, what's your story? We know building the right financial plan means looking at more than just money. That's why we start by asking the right questions, listening to what matters most to you, then guiding you every step of the way to help you live the life you want now and years from now. Plan your financial story with Montage Planning Partners with Northwestern Mutual, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Contact Montage Planning Partners today. Visit montageplanningpartners.com for further information and disclosures. This episode is brought to you by Sweat Tent, the pioneers of the portable wood-burning sauna. Did you know that using the sauna three to four times per week could reduce your risk of cardiovascular disease by up to 50% and make you 60% less likely to experience Alzheimer's disease? That's why I've been a big fan of the sauna for years. But having to go to a crowded gym to do it isn't ideal. And all the at-home options are bulky and expensive. That's why I only use the sweat tent for my sauna needs. It's the most storable and affordable wood-burning sauna on the market. It not only takes minutes to set up, but it can reach 200 degrees Fahrenheit in 30 minutes or less. So whether you're enjoying it yourself in your backyard, with friends, or in need of a reliable sauna on the go, sweat tent is your best choice for the most portable, storable, and enjoyable outdoor sauna experience. All On The Stacks listeners will receive $100 off when you use code OTS. Visit sweattent.com today to get $100 off your purchase with code OTS at checkout. Again, that's sweattent.com to get $100 off with code OTS. Sweat Tent, helping you fire up your home wellness routine. This episode is brought to you by Wilkes Consulting, a Ramsey preferred coaching firm. Are you drowning in debt? Is the weight of financial stress holding you back from living the life you were meant to live? then it's time to break free and regain control of your financial future. Wilkes Consulting specializes in financial and debt consulting. Their team of four highly trained Ramsey Solutions Advisors are ready to help you take charge of your money. Whether you're looking to get out of debt, pay off student loans, or simply need assistance on how to prepare to buy a home, Wilkes Consulting can help you fine-tune your budget and provide the resources and guidance you need to meet your goals. Don't let debt or the fear of finances control your life any longer. Head over to WilcoPA.com and book a hassle-free, no-obligation call. Your first step towards financial freedom. Again, that's WilcoPA.com. W-I-L-C-O-P-A.com. Wilkes Consulting, making financial independence a reality. This episode is brought to you by FitAF. If you haven't already noticed, I live and breathe entrepreneurship. Whether it's launching new ventures, attending pitch meetings, or mentoring budding entrepreneurs, my schedule is jam-packed. And that's where FitAF steps in. Their menu changes weekly, offering a variety of chef-inspired meals designed by nutrition experts using only the best quality ingredients, keeping me fueled and focused. Their vast selection of meals has you covered for all types of dietary restrictions and diet plans, including keto, paleo, vegetarian, vegan, gluten-free, and more. As an On The Stacks listener, enjoy our exclusive offer. Get 20% off your first order of seven meals or more when you use code OTS at checkout at fitafnutrition.com. Again, that's code OTS for 20% off your first order of seven meals or more at fitafnutrition.com. 
Healthy meals and seamless nutrition, keeping entrepreneurs at the top of their game. What's up, podcast? I'm your host, Bill Corcoran Jr. here in the MPP studio. Dan Ariely, welcome to the On The Stacks podcast. Lovely to be here. Yeah, Dan, thank you for joining me. I'm great to have you here. Just finished your book. Uh, and uh, be- But before we dive into that, we we got to give uh, Laura Mai a shout out for for introducing us. Uh, I, I, I yeah, I saw I saw an episode um, you know with, of you of you on her show, and uh, I was recently a guest on her show as well. And uh, her and I were just chatting after, and she said she knew you, and and she's like, yeah, if, if he's interested, I'll see if we if I can hook you guys up. And I'm like, yeah, let's do it. I'd love to love to ch- have a chat with Dan. So so thanks again for joining me. Absolutely. So. Before before we really you know jump into into your book misbelief, I want to go back a little just to better understand Dan where you come from and what really sparked your interest in irrational behavior. Yeah, so so uh, lots of ways to start this, but maybe I'll uh, I'll talk about my strange look and my half a beard. Uh, so this uh, this beard has a couple of reasons. This half a beard. Uh, the first one is that I was badly burned. Uh, I was burned uh, in about 70% of my body, and I spent three years in hospital. And the right side of my face is just full of scars, so the hair doesn't grow on this on this side. Uh, so that's kind of story number one. I was a burn patient, three years in hospital. Burns are very, very painful, by the way. Um, lots of experience of pain, lots of experience with medications, placebos, and, and so on. But going back to the half a beard, of course, I could shave. And if I shaved, I would look less strange than I look now. And for many years, I shaved. And I looked less strange. And then about a few years ago, I went on a month-long hike. And at the end of this month-long hike, I looked sort of like this. And I looked in the mirror, and I didn't like myself. It's a very strange look. (laughs) If you're looking at me for the first time, it's a strange look. It was strange for me. And I thought I'll... I'll shave it off, but I thought I'll keep it for a few weeks just kind of for the memory of the hike. You know, it's a leftover. Um, but then I, I posted a few things on social media about all kinds of things, not about the half a beard. And I was very surprised and people reached out to me and thanked me for the half a beard. Now, why would anybody thank me for the half a beard? Uh, these are people who were struggling with their own injuries and they felt they had to hide their injury. And they said that the fact I was so out with my injury gave them a little bit of strength. So for example, there was a woman in her 60s that said that she was injured in a car accident when she was 17 and she she didn't wear a dress or a skirt since. And she was going to try. So I thought, okay, if this half a beard and this strange look is giving people some courage to not hide their own injuries, uh, maybe I'll keep it for a little longer as a public service announcement. Um, so I kept it. And then four months into it, something very strange happened. Four months into it, I felt that uh, my own attitude to my own injury has changed. You know, I've been carrying this injury for a long time. I have lots of deformities. Uh, things are difficult for me. I have disability. I have a uh, pain. But, but I felt kind of less estranged from the injury. I felt it was more like the story of my life. And I wondered what happened, why now? When, like so many years ago, why now do I all of a sudden feel different? And I think the story is about the half a beard. So imagine somebody like me shaving or half shaving. I wake up in the morning, stubble on one side, smooth on the other one, and, and the act of half shaving is also an act of hiding. It's the same thing that those people told me about. It's an act of uh, becoming less non-symmetrical and stopping it and accepting my own asymmetry was incredibly very healing. It was was actually very, very healing and surprisingly healing. Okay, but so what's the point of all of this? Because I was trying to introduce myself. So I'm a social scientist and I'm surprised I'm I'm trying to find elements of life that we could do better with, like the the secrets to how to live better. And if you think about this half a beard, here I was, a social scientist. Uh, My mother thinks a good social scientist, and I shaved for way too many years. 
I thought that shaving was the right way to go. I thought that hiding my lack of symmetry was, was or minimizing it was the right way to go, when in fact the opposite. Letting go was, was the right thing to do. And, and that's really the goal of social science and what I try to do. So I try to find those things that we are doing with good intentions, right? I shaved for many years for good intentions, but to understand that maybe we're not doing things that are actually good for us, and we should do something differently. And that's, a, that's one example of that. Of course, it's not just about facial hair. Uh, this approach of social science to try to find out what our intuitions lead us and what actually helps us, that's kind of the cornerstone for me of, of how to use social science. Wow, that is that's very fascinating, and thank you for sharing that story. Um, I think I think you know there's a lot to be learned from from that story and from you know you know what you what you did there and and sharing that story of of that woman who who was you know I'll say uh, afraid to you know accept or whatever whatever she was struggling with internally, and I think you know by putting that you yourself you made yourself vulnerable right and put yourself in a position that like you wouldn't have previously and it gave others to to the encouragement to be able to do the same. And I think that's so yeah. important. Like I really, really do. And, and, and I think that's great. Um, by the way, I think, I think, I think you look like a badass with half the beard. So you should, <laughs> if you, if you shave it, I'm actually going to be disappointed. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it, it, it does come with a cost. It, it's a, uh, thank you for the compliment. You know, uh, kids laugh. I mean, people point, it comes with a cost. Um, so it's not it's not all all good. It's a, it's mixed. It's a mixed bag. I think on, on the, it's positive overall, but it, it's a mixed bag. But um, I uh, I get from time to time um, notes from people who say that uh, like somebody said you're lucky that you have half a beard. And what what he meant was that this was a guy who was struggling with a mental issue. And he said that the people with physical injuries have an advantage that um, it's obvious, right? If you try to shake my hand, it's very clear that the hand is very injured and it's very clear that uh, I need help and there's all kinds of things I can't do. Um, but somebody with a mental injury that's a, or mental issue, that's a, that's a very different story. That's something that is very hard uh, to, to, for people to see, very hard for people to have empathy. But as a society, we really need to do something about that. By the way, I have a talk. I was supposed to have a call this to, today. It's, it's postponed to tomorrow with the guy who is responsible for all the um, all the veterans in Ukraine. Crazy amount of people with injuries. Uh, very very tough to get integrated into society, um, and and he he's in charge of trying to figure out how you integrate them into society. Lots of lots of challenges. Yeah, so just kind of kind of going back to that that whole um, that notion of just you know I mean essentially you you kind of exp you, you kind of yourself were an experiment would you, would you say that that's true? So so experiments you know require random assignment. I mean there's technical things about experiments. We require many people and statistical inference and so on. But I I definitely experiment on myself. I wouldn't call it it's an experiment, but I I certainly experiment on myself. And by the way, I do it with lots of things. I, I love, I think, I think we need to, okay, so I think we're generally amateur in everything we do. So we don't know how to use our money to make our life better. We don't know how to manage relationships. We don't know how to sleep well. We don't know what food will be good for us, what exercise will be good. So we're, we're kind of amateur in everything we do. It's, it's kind of amazing when you think about it. You say, oh, do you know how to use your money for to maximize your happiness and you say well not really <laughs> do you know how to raise your kids so they will uh, no not really so i i think we're very much amateurs and and i think social science helps us with some hints about how to do better but there are other things that we just need to try yeah we just need to try we need to understand that our intuitions you see if our intuitions were always correct then we would be there would be no problem. But if if you start to think that your intuitions are wrong, then you say, okay, I need to try different things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you can you can you explain that a little further? Yeah. So so think about the question of using our money to maximize our happiness. Uh, it turns out that there's lots of things that we don't do right. 
turns out that we think that buying stuff would have a better improvement in our quality of life than buying experiences, but it's not true. Uh, it turns out that if you give people a voucher for a free cappuccino and you say, what would you do with it? People say, oh, I really want to buy a cappuccino for myself. But it turns out that if they go and they give the cappuccino to a stranger in a coffee shop, they end up being happier. Uh, it turns out if they give it to a friend and it lubricates their social relationship, it's even happier. Um, so, so there's lots of things that we we are just not doing the right thing. Um, notifications on your phone. <laughs> well, that's okay, a big one. People realize that they've too many of those. But you know, when when people take off notifications from their phone, they have uh, two weeks of adjustment period. And during that adjustment period, they suffer. They say, oh, it's not a good idea. I really want notification back. No, no, no. Hold on, wait. In two weeks, it will be better. Um, so, so there are lots of things that we... What feels right is not necessarily what's, what's right mm. in, the, in the long term. And it goes on and on. I mean, think about emotions in general. Emotions in general derail us. Right now, I really feel like French fries. Is it really good for me? Not so much. Um, so, so we we. What feels right at the moment is not necessarily what's right, and and we need help to figure out what are the things that are right. And how do we do that? So, social science provides some answers, right? So, if you ask me, like I gave you a couple of hints, right? I say, uh, buy more experiences, buy less stuff. Um, uh, put put more money away than you think. Uh, when you go out to dinner, uh, don't get an appetizer and dessert. Um, uh, say more thank you to people. Uh, we do, we don't give enough compliments. So there's a, there's a whole list of things that we could do. Uh, we could do better, but there are some things that we have to try for ourselves. So let's say exercise. I asked you, uh, oh, so do you exercise? I do. What do you do? So I have, uh, they're actually a sponsor of my show called Burn. It's a, it's a, it's a slide board. Uh, it's, a, it's like aerobic and a mix, mix of a different workouts. Okay. Uh, so so um, I, have, I, I don't know. I, don't, uh, I can kind of try to imagine what it is, but I'll check it out after the. Yep, yep. B triple R N. Okay. If you can, send me a link. I'll, I'll I will. Check it. I'll check it. Absolutely. Later. But if you think about exercise, um, there's a question of what exercise would fit with our routine. And each of us has a different routine. And, and maybe exercise one is ideal and exercise B is not ideal, but which one would fit in your routine and how? And we need to experiment. Mm. We need to try yeah. different things. So, you know, will, would, would running work for you under what circumstances? Um, you know, so kind of trying to figure out Try to figure out what puts us to sleep. By the way, for me, it's a podcast with British accents. <laughs> that's, that, that's the trick, that's huh? My, that's my, my secret. But, you know, what, what helps us fall asleep and what helps us get energized in the morning? And um, some people are morning people, some people are evening people. How do you make sure that you have productive time in the day? So there's lots of little tricks to living well. And also things that we have to figure out for ourselves. So, you know, let's say you ask people, are you a morning person or evening person? Okay, here is what you think you are. Let's, are you designing your work accordingly? Like if you're a morning person and you, and you waste the morning hours on, on email and Facebook, what a waste. If you're an evening person and you, you're wasting the, these productive hours on something that doesn't require thought and concentration, what, what a waste. So, there are general insights from social science, and then there are things that we need to figure out for ourselves. So I think I, I think kind of like what, what I'm, a little bit of what I'm getting from it is is really being more conscious of of what you're doing and, and maybe doing things intentionally and testing and trying and learning, right. seeing seeing what works, seeing what doesn't, seeing if it helps you perform, if it doesn't, and then just changing direction based on the results of how you feel. Is that is that right? That, that's right. And, and I'm also saying that that uh, that social science provides some hints of where to start from, right? So if you say let's start sleeping better, you don't have to start from a blank slate. 
Uh, people have tested uh, cold temperature, people have tested uh, darkness, people have tested lavender smell, a pillow under your knee. So you don't have to start from scratch. Start from something that that is actually working for mm -hmm. some people. Yeah, so we don't have to reinvent the wheel. That's right. Yeah. So let's 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 um jump a little bit into your book and let's kind of start with uh you know your book Misbelief. Where 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 did where did the where did that come from? Where did that start? I know it's a long-winded yeah. question, but but what's the, what's no no it's a, it's a very good question because it's so different from my other books. Right. So I, I it's 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 my eighth book. So I've had I wrote a few of them, <laughs> and all my other books start with research. I did research on the psychology of money. I did research on motivation. I did research on relationships, all kinds of things like that. And then I say, okay, and now let me try and explain it in in everyday terms about what it means and what are the implications of this. And, and this book is different because it didn't start with research. It started with a real problem where I was personally attacked. So it's not a book about COVID. It's a book about misbelief, but it's it started in COVID. So go back to early 2020, COVID is around, we don't understand what's going on, and there's lots of questions. There are questions about how do we do remote work and remote education, and whether we give people fines, and how do we get people to start adopting masks and wash their hands more, and what do we do with domestic violence, and a million questions. And I try to be as helpful as possible. I try to just be as helpful as possible, and I'm busy day and night answering questions, government, companies, all kinds of things. And quite a few months into it, where I feel I am achieving my mission in life. Here I am a social scientist, the world needs social science, and I am in the right place to help. I get an email from somebody I once helped, and she says, Dan, what happened to you? How did you become that person? And I answer quickly, I'm between lots of things. I say, what do you mean that other person? What other person? And she sends me back lots of links, and I'll describe one of them. One link describes a video of me in hospital. It shows pictures of me in hospital. It says that I was badly injured, 70% of my body, true. Almost three years in hospital, true. But then it goes on to say that because of that, I started hating healthy people. And this is why I joined Bill Gates, the Illuminati, the Cabal, to try and kill as many people as possible with the pandemic and later on with the, with the vaccine. There were no vaccines at the time. Anyway, I saw this, and there are lots of links, lots of things. Like, you know, it's like, um, imagine you, imagine I tell you one day, here's a bunch of links, and you see all kinds of people discuss you as if you're a villain. It was just such a, how can they think this about me? I wake up every day, only think I stopped all my work. I only think about the how to help people. <laughs> how do they think about this? How do they come? Anyway, I spent about a month uh, trying to argue with them. I joined discussions. I talked to people directly. I joined Telegram groups and WhatsApp groups and uh, Zoom calls. Almost zero success. Almost zero success. Why do you think that is? Because because it's not about information. It's not about information. Those the, the the nature of beliefs is that they are at some level when they get to a very extreme level, they're immune from information. Think about beliefs in uh, abortions, whatever whatever side you're on. How open are we to information? Uh, think about beliefs about climate change. How open are we to, to information? So those discussions were very strange. And, you know, it's one thing when somebody says, oh, I think the earth is flat. But when somebody tells you something about you, I say, Bill, I saw what you did yesterday. You did X, Y, and Z, and shame on you. And you say, no, no, I didn't do X, Y, and Z. I wasn't even in that place yesterday. I said, no, no, I've seen you. I know you did it. And so on. So when somebody says that I'm the mastermind behind the COVID pandemic and, and there's nothing I can show them to change their mind, it's very, very eerie. So, so I decided to stop trying to convince them. And I decided to try to understand it. It just seemed to me that it was such a huge, painful problem 
that I had to try and do something about it. So I started. So I started and I um, I became partially an anthropologist when I talked to lots of those people, not intending to change them anymore, just intend to understand them. Uh, I did some lab research, I did some field research. I and, and eventually what I ended up describing in the book, it's called misbelief. The, the, what I end up describing in the book is this mechanism that we as a society created, you know, with lots of different pieces that attack almost all of our psychology. It attacks our emotional system. It attacks our cognitive system. It attacks our personality system. It attacks our social system. You know, if you think about the cookie as a weaponized food that is attacking our smell and, uh, and taste with sugar, fat, and salt, with an ideal combination to want you to get one and then another one, another one, another one, the funnel of misbelief, these four elements, are taking advantage of a lot of our human weaknesses and basically getting normal people to believe very strange things. And, and I, I think that's an important point. You know, I, I don't like the term conspiracy because it's derogatory and because it makes people feel that it could never happen to us. Oh, it's these other people. But, but no, I think that all of us under the right circumstances or under the wrong circumstances could be susceptible to, to misbelieve. It's important to understand it. So almost everybody, you tell me if you, you do too, almost everybody has somebody in our network, somebody in a close circle or further away circle, that five years ago we felt we and them are kind of the same type, that we and them are looking at the world in the same way, interpreting it the same way and so on. And now we look at these people and say, I, I don't understand. How do they think? Like, what's broken inside? How can they look at the same world and come up with such different conclusions? And it's not about them not being smart or kind or generous or wonderful people. Um, it's about them going through the funnel of misbelief. And it's life circumstances started them. And then technology and social pressure and, and lots of other forces got them to, to continue on that, on that path. Yeah. So one one of the words, um, you know, that, you know, from listening to some of your talks, reading your books, like the word stress and stress seems to be like a trigger uh, of Absolutely. of an event similar to what you're saying now. Can you can you speak on that a little bit? Yeah. So you're absolutely right. The, the, if If we did not experience stress, everything would be fine. Stress is a necessary, insufficient, but necessary condition. And when we talk about stress, I don't mean the stress of saying, gee, I have so many emails to answer, I'm not sure I'll manage. The stress that we have in mind is the stress of the type, I don't understand the world. I don't understand why I'm not doing better. I'm not understand why I'm suffering and other people are not. I don't understand how the world is working, all kinds of things like that. And one of the things about stress is when we feel stress, we feel we don't understand the world, we want a story. And not only do we want a story, but we want a story with a villain. And, you know, the internet provides lots of stories with villains. And, and we, so we have an urge to look for a story. We have an urge to look for a story with a villain, and then we find one. Now, it's worthwhile saying that we're not only, like, if you think about COVID, COVID was a period with high stress. What's happening? What, what, what is this virus? Yes, surfaces, no surfaces. Masks are helping, not helping. Yes, China, no China. Lab, animals, yes, vaccine, no vaccine. Uh, like the, the amount of stress was just very, very high. But we are living in a period that we not only have high stress, but we have high stress and low resilience. By the way, we're, we're past COVID now, but when I think about my students, they are very stressed. Uh, for example, they often ask me whether whatever they're studying now will still be a profession three years from now, given AI. Not so sure, right? Hard to hard yeah. to say. Yeah, fear of the unknown. V very much. Like you tell me that whatever I'm studying right now, am I not wasting my time? And I said, I don't know. I can't tell you. Yeah. Um, so. You know, if you want to study how to become a, an air conditioner mechanic, <laughs> there'll be lots of jobs. But for other things, 
a little harder to, to, to promise. So, so why am I saying that we're at the low period of resilience? You know, usually, resilience is what allows us to sustain a period of high unknown because you have like a, an insurance policy. You feel good in, in general. So I have resilience. I have people to trust. I have, but, but we had some, some big changes in society that have uh, negatively affected our, our resilience. Um, we spend less time with friends and more time with the nuclear family. Uh, at work, we're not supposed to talk about personal stuff anymore. We certainly are discouraged from talking about romantic relationship. We're certainly discouraged to talk about politics. So, so we have less friends. The friends at work are now work friends. They're not real friends. Um, and we spend more time on social media, less time face to face. And then the last thing is that we, as economic inequality increases, resilience goes down. And why is that? Because when economic inequality increases, we're less likely to ask for help from other people. So, so that also increases resilience. So high stress, the world is stressed for violence, political polarization, COVID, economic, and then on top of it, low resilience, it opens the door to um, a real search. Tell me what's going on here, right? Think about QAnon. Right. Here's here's an unbelievably complex and interesting story with a villain that basically says, "Let me now explain to you what's happening in the world. What you're experiencing is not your fault. It's not what it seems. It's that." And 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 something like QAnon also gives people the belief that they understand something that other people don't. So if you think about the people who are saying, "I don't understand the world. I don't know why am I not getting my share." Now they say, oh, I'm the one who truly understands the world. You, the regular people, uh, you don't understand the world. I'm the one who truly, truly understands it. So, so that's the starting point. Then, of course, we have cognition. We have all kinds of things about the way we process information. We have personality. Some people are more likely to go down the funnel of misbelief. Some people are less likely. And then we have the social element, which is really what ends up sealing the deal. That if people get sucked into having much of their social life uh, connected to their misbelief, um, that really seals the deal. Um, what, one more important question. For me, misbelief has two elements. The first one is that you believe in something that ain't so. That's one. But the second is that you adopt it as a way from which you view life. It's like a lens or glasses from which you view life. So if somebody, for example, is just skeptical and somebody saying, you know, sounds to me like the world is, 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 the earth is round. Like that seems very, reasonable, but, I, but I'm willing to entertain the idea that there's a, a chance that it's flat. Let's say somebody is doing that. Um, that's very, very different than somebody saying the earth is flat and I'm 100% sure about it. Because the moment you're 100% sure about something, it has other ramification because you start looking at the world from that perspective. So if you believe the earth is flat, you also believe that NASA is lying to you and the US government is lying to you. And every pilot knows the right answer and they're not saying. And every country in the world is in on it because every country in the world. Somebody knows the real answer and they don't share it. And there's no satellites and no communications. And then you say, okay, so this is a very complex lie. Lots of people are involved. Who are those people? Why are you telling me? And what else are they hiding? So if you wake up in the morning and you're a flat earther, you're looking at everything with suspicion. On the Stacks will be back in a flash after a word from our sponsor. This episode is brought to you by Elevation Wellness, NEPA's premier wellness center located on Monday Street in Wilkes-Barre. From pro athletes to busy parents, Elevation Wellness is leading the conversation when it comes to bettering your health through integrative medicine. 
Founded by NEPA native Louis Helmecki, Elevation Wellness offers physician-formulated and guided treatments that are administered by registered nurses. To learn more about how you can experience the benefits of IV vitamin therapy, multivitamin booster shots, non-invasive aesthetics, or peptide, NAD, red light, and compression therapy, visit elevation-wellness.com or follow them on Instagram at elevationwellnessnepa. All on the Stacks listeners will receive 10% off their first purchase with code STACKS at checkout. Call 570-762-9400 or visit elevation-wellness.com to book your appointment today. Elevation Wellness, taking your health to new heights. This episode is brought to you by Burn, the fitness company behind the Today Show approved Burn Board. If I'm being honest, working out can be a real chore, especially as a new dad in desperate need of sleep and cardio. Burn is founded by NEPA native Jimmy T. Martin, and his burn board offers a low-impact core and cardio experience unlike anything I've done before. They have hundreds of on-demand workouts that are great for beginners, seasoned athletes, and out-of-shape podcast hosts who love supporting small businesses. My wife and I use it pretty frequently throughout the week, and it's honestly a great way to burn a ton of calories without burning a ton of cash. Not to mention, it's a great tool for skiers, runners, wrestlers, and hockey players. Jimmy is offering all On The Stacks listeners 15% off when they use the code STACKS15. Visit theburn.com today to get 15% off your purchase with code STACKS15 at checkout. Again, that's theburn, T-H-E-B-R-R-N.com to get 15% off your purchase with code STACKS15. It's time to get on board today with Burn. We rely on the same nursing homes that you rely on. We expect the same care that you expect. When a loved one is neglected or harmed, it's personal because we live here, we raise our families here, we're invested here. To learn more, visit Anzalone Law Offices online at anzalonelaw.com. This episode is brought to you by Loop Internet. Are you tired of buffering, lagging, and slow internet speeds? Look no further. Introducing Loop Internet, Northeastern Pennsylvania's fastest and most reliable internet service provider. With Loop Internet, you can stream, game, and work from home seamlessly. Say goodbye to interruptions and hello to lightning fast connections. Loop Internet offers both residential and business fiber. Fast track the future with their 10 gigabyte fiber and join the Loop Internet family today. Visit Loop Internet online at loopinternet.com or call 1-888-808-5667. Again, that's 1-888-808-5667, or visit them online at loopinternet.com. Loop Internet, where speed meets reliability. And now, we're back on the stacks. Yeah, yeah, that's, um, I want to, I you know, kind of touching on the basis of, of, like, the evolution of misbeliefs, which I think you, you touched on a little bit a few minutes ago, but h- how have you know, the historical events, maybe not just COVID, right, but just general, in general, historical events and technological advancements influenced the evolution of misbeliefs over time. Yeah. So, so, so maybe we'll talk a little bit about the social element. So, so, so think about, think about our social life. So you, you start believing in something, maybe you starting Maybe you're starting to doubt whether the COVID vaccines are effective. Or maybe you're starting to doubt whether global warming is as as, as extreme as people are saying. Or maybe you're starting to doubt something. Um, and, you, and you bring up your ideas to somebody that you know. Uh, and they make fun of you. What is your instinct? Your instinct is to run away and to find other people that think like you and nobody would make fun of you. Now, it used to be very difficult, right? If you had a strange opinion in a, in a group of 50 people that all thought very differently than you, then you would basically have a hard time escaping. What could you do? Go to a different bar? Go to work in a different place? It would be very hard. But, but social media... Uh, does lots of things, including the ability, you know, it's also true for not just social media, it's true for WhatsApp and Telegram and so on, but we are able to gather with only people who believe like us. 
And, and that's an amazing technological change, right? So, so you all of a sudden you feel ostracized by, by your, your friends. Um, in, in the book, I go into the, the research on ostracism, which is fascinating. And it's important to understand that when people feel ostracized, the, the way that we process being ostracized is like the way we process pain. Feeling ridiculed and so on is a very, very intense feeling. So then we then we look for people like us, and we find people like us, and then we have a group of people like us, and we want to feel <laughs> good within that group. We want to seem like the leaders of the group. We don't want to just say standard things. So what do we do? We say more extreme things, and then we start getting likes. You know this. Uh, and then we start making more extreme things and so on. So, so one, one kind of interesting technology is the ability to find our own information bubbles, the one that makes us more comfortable. So we know that you can choose network one for television or network two, and that will give you information um, the way you like it and support your opinions. And every day you can watch the news and say, I knew it all along, I told you, and so on. And, it's because you're watching things that you agree with anyway you, you from by design. We also have things like TikTok, where TikTok chooses for you what you're going to be exposed, and you're not exactly sure how you got there. Um, but but this, the ability to choose only like-minded people is very bad for us cognitively because it increases our confidence a lot uh, without increasing our knowledge and giving us false uh, false beliefs, and then it gets us to become more extreme and so on. So, so that's one, uh, one technology, but I'll give you another example. Human beings are very trusting and there's a good reason for that. Imagine that we grew up evolutionary in small communities, let's say 200 people. So for thousands of years, we evolved, hundreds of thousands of years, we evolve in small communities with, let's say, 200 people. And when you live with 200 people, and it's the same people for most of your life, there are good reasons to trust those. Why? Because they would keep on working with you. They would keep on, and they want you to like them, and you want them to like you, and it's not uh, that you're a stranger in the night, and, you know. Plus, we have gossip which means that if you treat one of our mutual friends badly, uh, she, she will tell me and then I would, I would know about it. So when we lived in small communities, there were lots of mechanisms that made trusting people the right choice, you know, because it's mostly was worthwhile. But then we moved to big societies, right? Not 200 people. Uh, we're not interacting with the same people over and over necessarily. And then we moved online, and there's people who are anonymous and so on. Now we're still trusting. Our nature is still to trust. We are kind of carrying in our mind our, our tools from the past. And my metaphor for the human mind is that the human mind is like a Swiss army knife. The Swiss army knife is not particularly good at anything, but it's kind of a compact tool. Like you would say, oh, I need scissors. Let me go to the Swiss army knife. No. The, the benefit is that it's compact, not that it's good. It does lots of things in a very compact space. But our Swiss Army knife was designed to solve problems from thousands of years ago. It wasn't designed for the modern time. So we have a tool that says trust, trust first. Not, not, the, not something you would build from scratch now, but that's what we have, and, and we can't change it. So, so we're overly trusting. And now we created a technology that has mostly untrusted signals, but we're still trusting. So we have this mismatch between who we are as humanity and the technology. By the way, I think that the, the way to fix it is not to change humanity. That's too tough. For, the, the thing is to create a social media environment that would be worthy of our trust. So, so those are examples of, of things where the technology has, is incompatible with our humanity and taking advantage of us rather than letting us prosper. 
Mm. Do you think, do you think social media, you know, and, and, you know, just the, the evolution of social media and how fast technology is changing, do you think it has, you know, um, furthered, you know, the, I'll say manipulation or propaganda, uh, in today's society? No question about it. No question about it. So <clears throat> on, on multiple levels, you know, just the fact, just think about polarization. So let me let me give an example, another example of polarization. There's a there's a story in the Bible uh, about a tribe, two tribes that had a war, and these two tribes had a war, and after the war they settled on two sides of the river, and they would walk around and they would want to find out if the people that they met are from their tribe or from the other tribe. And it just so happened that these two tribes pronounced the name of the plant, shibolet, in slightly different way. One of them said shibolet, and one of them said sibolet. Shibolet is like a type of a wheat. So imagine that I walk around, and I have this plant in my hand, and I say, hey, you, stranger, how do you call this plant? And if you say it my name, we're brothers. We're from the same tribe. Everything is fine. If you say it like the people from the other tribe, now I try to chase you away or maybe kill you. And if you think about shibolet, we're using now this term, shibolet, as a, as a name for a conversation that is not about the facts. When I show you the plant and I say, what's the name of this plant? Do I care about the name of this plant? No, I care about your identity. So we use the term shibolet for a speech that is about identity and not about the facts. Now, it's very confusing because it sounds like it's a conversation about the facts but it's not really. So now think about our politicians or think about the discussion that we have that are loaded with, with political questions. Um, a global warming, a gender, a Gaza, a taxes, you know, you name it, abortions. Some of those discussions sound like they're discussions about the fact. But are they really discussion about the facts or are they discussion that sound like the fact, but are actually discussion about identity? Um, you know, think about something like gender. Every year, the science of gender is finding more and more differences between men and women, for example. Every year. That we find differences in blood flow and brain functioning. And like if you look at it in the science, it becomes more and more clear that there are real differences, important differences, and so on. Every year, the activists are saying there are less differences. Now, are these activists really saying there are less differences because they believe that they are like they we're more the same? No, the, the biology is quite clear. They're not saying something about the facts they're saying something about we want a world in which uh, people have equal opportunities but the way they say it is they say as if we're as if we're similar <laughs> we're not more similar we're more different okay it's very complex and the discussion is really about something um something very different so now polarization has also given us the ability um, to basically for each politician to talk to only their own people. Right? So if you ask the question of whether the U.S. now is one country, you would probably say no, not really. We're two countries. We're two countries. Um, the, the, the Republican leaders are talking to the Republicans and the Republicans' podcasts are talking to the Republicans and the Democrats are talking to the Democrats. And, you know, this is partially a technology problem. When we had one TV network, uh, we had a common understanding of the world, or even three. The moment we started specializing, now everybody has an incentive not to talk to everybody. So it, it has huge implications. So you think we became you know, too narrow-minded? Very, very narrow-minded. I think, I think, and you know, at the end of the day, this book is describing the psychology of misbelief and the funnel of misbelief, and it describes how all of us could fall into and the people who love and so on. But the big envelope for all of this is 
the question of trust. The big envelope around it is to say that once people adopt misbeliefs, on the right, on the left, doesn't matter, uh, we don't trust uh, institutions anymore. We don't trust the government anymore. Maybe we don't trust medicine anymore. You know, after COVID, there's a reduction in standard vaccinations. Right? What a, what a terrible impact uh, to have, to, to think that kids are getting less vaccinated now by the right and the left, by the way. Right. And, uh, <clears throat> and what, are, what, what are going to be the impact on that? So, yeah, so we, we have an, an ability to talk to just each other. We don't have the taming forces, right? If, if our presidential candidates thought that they talked to everybody, they would talk very differently. If they just talk to their one camp and it's about putting one camp against the other camp, that's a very unhelpful, and long term, it's a very unhelpful discussion. So imagine, ima we'll take the US, but it's true for other countries too. Imagine we have to do something together. Uh, imagine there was a COVID 2025. Um, Imagine that we need to fix our education system, roads. Uh, we want to uh, improve the infrastructure um, against outside interferences in our um, digital lives. You know, whatever we want to create, can we do it if we're two people? The answer is no, because if the first thing that you do is to say, this is a proposal from the other side, I'm against it. You know, how are we really going to get uh, to act together? So I think it's really, it's kind of multiple things happening together, all of them in a very bad direction. But we are at a, at a place where we have low trust, fragmented, uh, us versus them. Um, not a good start. And, you know, this uh, election, the 2024 elections in the state is, is not happening in a vacuum. It's happening as a as an election after the past election, right? And and the, the lack of trust that that created, and we're moving to the next phase of that. How do you how do you think you know the notion of misbelief uh, is affecting or going to affect the uh, this upcoming election? So first of all, I think that this this election will be the election of misinformation. Um, the last one had a lot, but I think this one will break records. And um, I don't actually like the term misinformation. I like the term corrosive information because misinformation just gives you a sense of, oh, you get some misinformation, then you'll get correct information, you'll fix it. The reality is that you can't really fix it. If you think about corrosive information, it means that somebody who's been exposed to it is, has been changed by the information, they'll not go to be, to be the same. Uh, so I think we'll have uh, more information or more, not information, more things that are guided toward hating the other side. I think we'll get uh, many more um, made, up, made up stories that, that separates us. Um, I think we would, um, we would encounter lots of, um, you know, fantasies that people have created. We'll have a lot of things that people connect the dots in all kinds of ways that are not actual. We'll get people who are very passionate about things they have uh, zero information about or very close to zero or maybe even uninformed um, about them. And um, this will drive funding, and it will drive uh, information on social media, and it will drive uh, voting. And I think that after the next election, uh, no matter who gets elected, we would be a more divided country than we are, even more divided than we are now. Right. So the, it's not just about who would get elected. Uh, the process, I think, is going to be damaging. Hmm. Yeah. That's um. It's very interesting. You know, like you know, like just like you said. Now, I mean. I think this country is already so divided and the fact that you're saying here right now that that this country is going to become even more divided after this election i mean that's that's a little scary it's very scary it's hard to imagine right yeah it is how can we be more divided um 
you know, and, and the, the, it's very hard for each of us as individuals to, to do much about it, right? because at the end of the day, uh, some of the main action needs to happen at the regulator, right? We need to basically say what, what can social media networks do and don't do? Um, is, is the like button or the share button the right mechanism? You know, liking or sharing are kind of interesting. When you share something, let's say you like something, what are you saying? Are you saying that you agree with it? Are you saying that it's ridiculous? You know, you, you can't tell. Yeah, it's it, it, it's right? very very, very interesting, very interesting conversation for sure. Yeah, and the, the moment you you put a layer between that and you say, like you say, imagine you click on like and then it has a button that says, "What do you mean by dislike? Do you mean that you you're sure this is true? Uh, you mean that you you think so, or you mean it's ridiculous, or you mean it's a uh, uh, you disagree with it. Uh, people think very differently. So there are things that we need to do on the social media. I just gave one example, but there are things we need to do on the social media stuff. Uh, but there's also things that we need to do on a personal level. Uh, think about these people that you knew five years ago and were just like you, and now they're different. Um, those people went through a very sad transformation. And you as their friend or relative or uh, could have done something to to slow it down. You could have done. So you know, we we each have, a, I think, a personal responsibility for the well-being of the people in our circles. And it's very easy and understandable that when people start having strange ideas, you say, "Okay, <laughs> go away. I never want to talk to you again," and so on. Uh, but we need to be there for them. Yeah. What do we, we do, do, Dan? What do we do? What do we do in that situation? So, so the first thing is not to ostracize. The first really thing is not to ostracize. It's very, very tempting, uh, but, but, uh, but we need to really not do it. The second thing, so, so we said that the funnel of misbelief has four components, right? We said stress, emotion, cognitive, personality, and social. Um, so on the social side, you want to basically prevent people from going into a 100% social world only with with people like them. Very important to, to keep them grounded in, in the rest of society. But there's an interesting thing on the cognitive side. So one of the things that happen is that people have beliefs and very little confidence. So um, two examples. One is that I ask people, how many of you have very strong opinion about climate change? And lots of people have very strong opinion, both sides, very strong opinion. And then I ask, what have you actually read about that stuff? And most people say almost nothing. And some people say, oh, I've read this or that. Some people said, I read the UN report. And then I said, did you really read the whole report or just a summary or just something about the report? And we say, yes, <laughs> I really didn't read the whole thing. So, so we end up having very strong opinions with, with very little evidence. In, in one experiment, I showed people a flush toilet, you know, one of those things that you, and I said, do you understand how a flush toilet works? And people say, yes. On a scale from one to seven, I understand it really well. Great. Luckily for you, here are all the pieces of a flush toilet. Please try to assemble it. Nobody manages to assemble it. And then I say, so how well do you understand flush toilet? And people say, not so much. Now, what does that mean? Think about it. In our regular day, when we try to convince people, we argue. Let's, let's say, characteristically, we have an hour. Somebody talk, we talk, we share the, the, the stage, we each talk half an hour over this hour. If I ask you, I say, Bill, the last three years, how many discussions you had about something where you fundamentally disagree with somebody? And at the end of that discussion, they said, you know what, Bill, you're absolutely right. I never heard such clever, thoughtful, articulated arguments. You're 100% correct, and I'm changing my opinion now. How often? Not much. <laughs> Not much. Not much. And, and, and I also asked, uh, how often did it happen the other way? Where you listen to somebody and said, you know what, you're absolutely right. right. I never thought about it this way. <laughs> right. So now, why does it happen? It happens because... When they talk, we don't listen. 
when they talk, they are kind of in the middle of the first sentence. We are already counter arguing. We are defending our position. We're not listening. So we finish an hour conversation. We talked for an hour. They talked for an hour. But in the other half an hour, we didn't listen. We counter argued. So you finish an hour like this, and you're actually more sure about your opinions from before because nothing penetrated, because you talked out loud for half an hour, and you talked in your mind for half an hour, counter arguing. The illusion of explanatory depth, that's how we call this idea, is saying, don't attack people. It's not working. Clearly, it's not working. Instead, what we should do is we should do what I did with the flush toilet. It says, explain to me how it works. So somebody comes to you and says, I think the last election in the US was stolen. And you say, OK, I'm not arguing with you. Help me understand how did it happen. Uh, first of all, help me understand how elections are being tallied. How do we even count the votes? And then after you explain to me how we count the votes, tell me how did somebody manage to manipulate it? And, and when you have this discussion, people say, you know what, I'm not really sure how votes are getting tallied, and I'm not really sure how it would get stolen. Where are like, um, you know, cracks in it? Um, and, and it's not as if you have this illusion of explanatory depth discussion and you move people from being pro-X to anti-X. But you basically change the confidence to be a little bit closer to our actual knowledge. And that's really the first step. The first step is not to convince people with facts. It's to basically get us to a more modest level of our confidence in our knowledge. And that's the open, right? Because if you're more modest in, a, in, a, in your confidence, now you're more open. So, you know, if I say, uh, whatever I can, we can talk about vaccines. We can talk about um, a climate. We can talk about anything. The moment you're not 100 percent sure, you're moving to 95. Now you're open to more, more discussion. So, so practically, we need to worry about ostracism. We said, and we need to get people to be exposed and 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 so on. But but the first step is to analyze the people who are in stress. In, in your environment, analyze that those are the people who are most likely going to get uh, fall down that that path, and then to basically uh, try to basically make sure that their confidence is not completely out of whack with their knowledge, and they keep on this possibility that maybe you're right, but maybe not. You know, if somebody says, "Maybe I'm wrong," very very different than I'm 100 sure that I'm right. Yeah, I think. Um... I think that's the key. I think, you know, I don't think anyone's ever, I mean, at least I, I, I subscribe to the the idea that, you know, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say, I believe this 100% because there's always, there's always that little bit. You just don't know. You just don't know. And like yeah. you said, going back to like, like the election thing, for example, like, I don't know how the election machines work. I don't know how they're tallied. I don't know all that back end stuff. I could read a little blip on social media or on the news and I could all of a sudden make a quick decision but like i haven't done the work to understand the system the process how it works how it how it failed how it didn't fail there's so much more to it that's right and and the moment by, by the way we th we started by talking about stress the stress is a driver with stress it's very difficult to maintain this position of i'm not sure about anything because stress once you're like okay i'm tired of this uncertainty let give me some some things i could be I could be sure of. So it's a, it's a real struggle that it's it's easy for us to sit here and we're comfortable and you know we have a, a coffee and and it's not a stressful day and to say oh I'm I'm open minded but when things are stressful and difficult and complex the the human tendency is to try and come up with with a solution uh, with a story with a villain only that we have to help the people around us not to succumb to that part of our job. By the way, you could start it from, from things that are simple. So let's say somebody believes in something about the elections. There's no need to attack first the election. You can attack zippers. Like you say to people, do you understand how a zipper works? They say, yes. You say, explain to me. <laughs> okay, no idea. <laughs> you know, so, so you, you can, you can uh, it turns out that <laughs> if you get people to doubt their knowledge in general, it's transferable. Yes, 
if you want to shake people's belief in what they know about climate change, go for climate change. But if you even talk about it in general, it helps get people into the mindset of saying, you know what, even the things that I thought I'm certain about, I'm not that certain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one last thing here before we end, Dan, I want to just uh, maybe talk just a little bit, you know, in, in terms of like the future. You know, based on current trends, what predictions do you have about the future landscape of misbeliefs and their impact on society over the next decade? When I, when I started writing this book, I promised my publisher a chapter on solutions. I ended up not having a chapter on solution. I have a chapter, I have lots of what I call he hopefully helpful. I have lots of suggestions for people to do things in our personal lives. It's not that we don't have suggestions. I have lots of suggestions, but that they are at the level of the regulators. And this is a book for individuals. It's not a book for policymakers. So there's no, there's no point to say this is what the regulators need to do. Um, I think that the history is not being written. And I'm hoping that we would all understand the importance of dealing with this topic. 10 years ago, if you asked me what are the most pressing problems for society, corrosive information would not have been there. Now it's one of them. In fact, now I think that we cannot do anything else until we solve that problem, until we solve polarization, I, until we solve trust in information. I don't think we can solve anything else. So I think the first thing we need to do is to make sure that we all understand how severe this problem is. It needs to be high on our priority list. And then there's lots of solutions. There are lots of ways to fix social media. There's lots of ways to fix information. There's lots of ways to fix the news. There are lots of ways to, you know, maybe not fix. Fix is too much. Improve dramatically. But we need to put it on our, um, on our priority list and make sure that we act on it. If we'll do that, I'm very optimistic. If we will not, I'm very pessimistic. But I think we have, um, we have a real fight. Um, you know, it, it's often the case that there's technology and then the first use of that technology is not so good. When the mail started, one of the first things that happened was mail fraud. Because you would mail people from another state and they said, send me a check. And they would send you a check. And you said, oh, I was joking. And there's nothing they could do. So then it became a federal issue to do mail fraud. We fixed it. Online media, the way we're doing information is, is the same. It got out of hand. It's not serving us right now. And we need to decide if we're going to tackle that head on or not. I hope we will. And, and, and I think reading and understanding in, the, in what trouble we are is, is important to basically creating the will to, to act. So I'm hoping that we'll act, and if we'll act, I'm optimistic. And if we'll not, I think it's just going to get worse. That's uh, I I appreciate that, and um, I, I definitely I definitely agree with you. And I'd love to maybe you know I know I know we're we're out of time here, but I'd love to uh, have another conversation with you, uh, in you know in the near future, may, maybe after the election, since we kind of touched on that a little bit. Um, so if you're open to it, uh, I'm sure our listeners and viewers would love to would love to hear more from you because I feel like we've only skimmed the surface here. Um, and I think too, I think introducing my audience, um, you know, to you if they don't already know about you, um, and if they haven't already, they could they could pick up a copy of uh, of your book Misbelief, and uh, and then that way they could they could you know read your book and and you know maybe next time if you're willing to come back on we could we could dive in a little further on some of these topics, um, and uh, and I, I think it'd be great. Very, very happy to jump. There's lots of things to talk about. Absolutely. Um, I'll just say that uh, one of my biggest topics of research these days is actually end of life. I'm trying to think about the last chapter of life from the moment people get diagnosed with terminal illness mm. until end of life and think about what are all the mistakes that people are making and how can we make it a better chapter. Is that what you're working on? That's mostly what I'm working on, yeah. Okay. I'd love to, I'd love to explore that next time too. Any, any, any time. My pleasure. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, uh, Dan Ariely, three-time New York Times bestselling author, Misbelief is out now. Pick it up. Appreciate you joining me on the Stacks in the MPP studio. Thanks, Dan. My pleasure. Nice to meet you. 
If you want to see more On The Stacks content, subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash On The Stacks podcast or search the hashtag On The Stacks on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn.